a, f a few months ago, uh, I was asked by some of the people involved in this symposium to write an essay for the brand new issue, the current issue, which is on sale outside today, of Houston History, formerly known as the Houston Review of History and Culture. <coughs> Pardon me. What I was asked to write about was the legacy of San Jacinto, as if that were a simple kind of thing. Um, I told them what I would rather do and what I would have to do is to write uh, an essay about the contending legacies of San Jacinto, because there is no single legacy of San Jacinto, nor is there a single perspective from which that great battle was is viewed or was viewed at the time, uh, nor is there a single narrative of the history of Texas and Texas independence and the Texas revolution. There are multiple narratives and I encourage you to pick up that issue uh, of which my essay is only a very small part. Uh, it's an issue completely devoted to the, to the uh, battle and the issues of San Jacinto uh, past and present. One of the things that we're going to be talking about all through this day's uh, event uh, are the contending perspectives and experiences of the people who were here. Uh, and I, I, I mean here, one of the, of, the, of, of the very nice things about Jeff Dunn's article uh, in the new uh, Houston history are those nice maps uh, which show the modern, uh, modern Texas and modern Houston with Sam Houston and Santa Ana walking across uh, the 610 loop uh, <laughs> and, uh, so that you can see pretty well just where those people were. There is really something special about going to the San Jacinto battlefield or to the Alamo or to Goliad or to uh, Spanish Fort uh, up in my part of Texas where the French and the Spanish clashed in the 1750s. Uh, where the archaeologists are finding things new constantly. When, when archaeologists dig, the story changes. When historians dig, the story changes. If you're a working historian, you're a revisionist historian. It's not a bad word. It's something that we should take pride in. And one of the things that we try to do in the San Jacinto Symposium is to encourage people to question the past, to question the stories they've heard about the past, to listen to other people's stories to see what they can learn, uh, to see if we're just talking past each other sometimes about the past, and to see if maybe the language we're using uh, to talk about the past uh, even uh, can distort the way we think about the past and therefore the way we think about ourselves. Um, I didn't hear of Juan Seguin until I was in graduate school. He was missing from my Texas history, absolutely missing in action when I took Texas history in the 1950s and went through college in the 1960s. I was out of Texas before someone said, hey, have you ever heard of Juan Seguin? Uh, when I was in graduate school in the late 60s and early 70s. Now, Commissioner Garcia tells me there's about to be a, a Juan Seguin Park. Uh, I guess on the south bank of the Lynchburg Ferry, uh, or the, uh, is it the Lynchburg Ferry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the sides of the Lynchburg Ferry, my directional uh, sense is not too good. I w once took that uh, ferry by accident uh, when I was trying to get to the San Jacinto battlefield and found I'd taken a shortcut. Um, I was with my friend Jim Lutzweiler, uh, who, as some of you know, you saw him here last year, is something of a loose cannon. Uh, he insisted on doing DNA research uh, in looking for Emily Morgan. Uh, uh, his his, his uh, sense of history was, uh, was a little too mythologized that day. But um, uh, seriously, um, putting people back into the past and then therefore back into our present and back into what we think about ourselves and our identity uh, is really what historians are all about. Very often the winners write history immediately after the events take place. They write a history which is used to shore up their position. Uh, usually it is so oversimplified that it takes on the character of myth. Myth, by definition, is not a falsehood, but is a, is a version of the past which is so selective 
and so oversimplified that it becomes distorting. And if we begin to confuse myth with history, if we think we have all the answers when we begin talking about history, then we're not doing history, we're doing myth. Myth is what you're doing when you think you have all the answers already. History is what you're doing when you keep an open mind and try to uh, see what you can learn day by day and year by year about the past. Historians are charged with both representing the past and representing the past. They're spelled the same, but there's a hyphen in the second one. Um, when we represent the past, we try to distill from those thousands and thousands of little fragments of the past that have come down to us in the present. Uh, we try to decide what is representative. How can we best, maybe like Picasso, if we're very good, represent the reality of a conquistador with maybe just a few pen strokes? Because we don't have time to give you the whole past. If we talked about the Texas Revolution in its entirety today, it would take us longer than it would be the longer than it took to fight the Texas Revolution. By definition, we have to bring things down, try not to oversimplify while we're drawing those strokes which help you understand what's most important, what's most significant, what that trajectory of the past bringing us into the present was, and how multiple trajectories intersect and interact with each other during that time. But we're also not just rep representing the past by our always inadequate efforts, but we're also representing the past, presenting the past to you anew, if we do our job right, giving you a new perspective, representing the past as experienced by people whose perspectives and whose voices have been perhaps silenced, perhaps obscured, uh, perhaps ignored in the overarching narrative, very often a mythic narrative, that we've taken to be the true and only history of Texas. Uh, one of the people who is uh, especially adept at bringing us to these, some of, bringing to to us some of these uh, perspectives uh, is our first speaker, our uh, Paula Mitchell Marks. You'll find that all of our speakers today are bringing you different perspectives and different angles. Some on the same events, even uh, uh, of the Texas Revolution and Texas Republic. But Paula has been especially good at looking at the past through different perspectives and bringing the past to the present in different forms. Um, now, she does get into the Hollywood aspect of the, of the American West. She talks about gold rushes and gunfights at OK Corrals. Um, but she also talks about uh, Texas farm women and the, and the home textile industry. Uh, which you may think is a real sleeper until you realize that it's an essential part of what's going on in this state, an essential part of the economy and, a, and an essential part of the way people uh, live their lives. Um, uh, she, she takes us into families such as the Mavericks of San Antonio, uh, both in one of her early books, Turn Your Eyes Toward Texas, uh, Sam and Mary Maverick's uh, uh, lives, and then in uh, the, a book that I think is underway right now, The Maverick's Experience of the, of the Civil War in Texas. Um, Paula, as, she, uh, uh, as, as, as you've been told on your, uh, uh, on your bulletin, wears three hats at St. Edwards University. Uh, Associate Dean of Administration for the New College, Director of Master of Liberal Arts Programs, uh, Professor of American Studies, and of course a very prolific writer uh, when she puts that fourth hat on at home uh, and, uh, or wherever she can find time uh, to write. It may be on the bus or the, uh, 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 because she's so busy doing other things as we'll see today as she leaves us, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, the, in the middle of the day. Um, her PhD is in American Civilization from the University of Texas at Austin. She's a fellow 
of the Texas State Historical Association and a member of the Texas Institute of Letters, and we're fortunate to have her here to speak to us today. Dr. Marks. Thank you, Jim. I'm very happy to be here this morning with you. I enjoyed last night meeting with some of you and, and uh, was impressed by the breadth and depth of history that I heard from uh, people attending the party last night. I'm going to speak today. Let me move this down a little bit. <coughs> on women in the conflicts of the Texas Revolution and Republic. And I do so my uh, when I did American Studies at UT, uh, in, in American studies you have four areas, and one is general American studies, and then you have three other areas. So one of my areas was women's history, American women's history, and another area was American frontiers, and then the third was American literature. So uh, I've been fortunate to be able to combine those interests in a variety of ways over the years. But this quote will look familiar, I'm sure, to many of you. Noah Smithwick, Evolution of a State. Uh, his comment that early Texas, he went to one of the impresario settlements and, and found the women pining for home and not having the resources to do many of their, their normal duties. And he said that Texas, or he quoted a woman saying that Texas was a, a heaven for men and dogs, but a hell for women and oxen. And so I picked that up. It's a little bit earlier than the revolution, but I picked it up as a question. <laughs> What did the Revolution and the, uh, the Republic period mean to women? And what part did they play in the conflicts? And I'm reminding myself here, it goes along with what Jim was saying about the fact that I have a tendency to think about women in the Revolution and Republic strictly in terms of the Anglo women and perhaps the African American women who came in during this period. But uh, you'll notice that on the left I have a picture from the cover of, many of you are familiar with this book, Diana Everett's The Texas Cherokee, and uh, the fact that there were Cherokee women who were Texans in this period and had to endure quite a bit. Um, there were obviously African American women as well. There were uh, Tejana women. So we're always looking to be more inclusive in terms of when we talk about women's experience. I'm reminded of a book that came out in the 1970s, and the title of it was, remember this was an era when a lot of minority scholarship was being done, all the women were white, all the blacks were men, but some of us were brave. All the women were white, all the blacks were men, but some of us were brave. So making sure that we do have stories and that deal with the variety of women's experiences and identities in Texas at whatever time is part of what we are about. So what I'd like to do today is go through with you uh, the conflicts of the era that I have identified and then the ways in which women uh, had an experience of those conflicts. The first one, duh, is the revolution itself. So uh, everyone was affected to some extent by the Texas Revolution, as we all know. I think it's very interesting. Uh, some of you could say exactly what flag this is. I do, I do not know, but uh, the fact that we have a woman, a personification of liberty as a woman, and we see this. I was very interested in the wonderful talk last night, all the money and all the, the pictorial elements of the money that so many times there was a woman representing liberty or representing one of the Greek goddesses on, on the, the money itself. So we have this idealization, we have this personification going on for much of the, uh, uh, it, the ideology of the period. I skipped over one, didn't I? Also, we have troubles between settlers and Native Americans, especially the Comanches, and many of you are quite familiar with this. This is the Battle of Plum Creek when the Comanches raided all the way down to the coast and then were met by settlers near Lockhart. Uh, and, and I do have, a, have an exception. I, I think Frank is right that we very much need to, uh, 
to continue to stress Texas history, but those of you who are seventh grade history teachers, I had a couple of classes. I haven't taught Texas history in a few years, but I had a couple of classes that you would have been proud of. <laughs> uh, college students who, who remembered a lot. I was very surprised at how much they remembered, uh, and it was a great pleasure working with them when we, we have these students who come in and have been well-trained and have continued their interest in Texas history. We just need lots more of them, don't we? Um, so we have a, a number of conflicts during this period, 1836 to, uh, to 1845, and I'll come back to all of this. And then we have feuds. So I'm sure you all are familiar with some of the feuds that really came at a later time. I mean, the 1860s, 1870s, the post-war era, there were, there were many feuds. I, I, I did the introduction for a, a book by Sarah Harkey Hall about her life on the Texas frontier in San Saba County in the 1860s, and she actually lost three brothers to feuds. I mean, they were all killed in feuds, but this is an earlier period, but nonetheless, we do already have some feuds that have developed, and women obviously were not packing pistols, or at least I'm not aware that they were, but they were affected by these feuds. So that's another form of conflict that we need to deal with. And then finally, we have the fact that Mexico understandably refused to acknowledge Texas as an independent nation and continue to, to uh, claim Texas and to have threats and even incursions into Texas. So this is another area of conflict that women as well as men, whatever groups they belonged to, had to deal with during the period. Now, I'm going to back up and I'm going to talk about women's roles in this era. And I have cult of true womanhood down here, but I have a lot of terms that I could throw at you, and probably many of you are familiar with these terms. Uh, the cult of true, true womanhood emerged in the early 19th century as a means of defining women and the ideal women and it rings very um, quaint to us today, at least I hope it does, because the tenets of the cult of true womanhood were that women were to be pious and pure and self-sacrificing and submissive. So this idealization of women, it was putting women on a pedestal, but also uh, confining them in various ways. And when I say cult of true womanhood, I'm talking about about the U.S. in general. What happened in the Northeast, of course, was that industrialization was taking hold. And gradually, the home as a workplace was disappearing. And a particular, um, a favorite phrase of mine is domestic artisan. In the pre-industrial era, women were domestic artisans. When almost everything was produced at home, then women had a very clear economic role within the home as economic unit. But as, as industry took over in providing many of the necessities of life, how was women's role to be defined? And one way was, uh, at its most most trekly, I suppose, the angel of the household. <laughs> so that was a common phrase in the, in the early 19th century, too, that that woman's role was to be the angel of the household, that she was to provide a refuge for men who were out in the public sphere. And we also get into another term, the doctrine of separate spheres. So the idea that woman's role is in the home and man's role is out in the public world. And so all of these ideas are circulating in the culture as a whole, in the, the U.S. culture as a whole, and because we have so many immigrants from the United States, we have to assume that they have inculcated that. And this is a little aside, but I want to share it. Uh, as uh, Jim said, I, I worked on a biography of Samuel and Mary Maverick of San Antonio, and it was very interesting to me. In the uh, early 1850s, Mary Maverick wrote to her husband, who was away, as he often was, 
we'll talk about that too, the deputy husband aspect. But she wrote to him and she said, there is a professor in San Antonio who is a, a psychology professor and he has agreed to take a group of women. If he can get seven women together, we, uh, he will work with us. And she says, now my dear, you know I have no desire to put on the bloomer costume. Mm -hmm. Amelia Bloomer and the Bloomer costume. Actually, it was very, very recent. Mary Maverick was up to date <laughs> about some of the events that were happening at this time. I have no desire to put on the Bloomer costume, but I would like to take this class because I think it would help me deal with George's, that's one of their children, it would help me deal with George's headaches. So she was using that self-sacrificing mode or the sense that she's doing it for the family, um, that uh, <coughs> she's not necessarily doing it for herself. But we have, we have, so we have the domestic artisan, which actually continues on the frontier, right? Because you can't exactly be an angel of the home <laughs> when you're living on the frontier and there are all these things to do. So one of the reasons that I enjoy studying the frontier is that we do continue to have women who may sometimes be very taxed by the conditions under which they live, but at the same time can take some pride in their ability to see to the, the physical needs of their families. Um, we also have, I want to bring up Republican motherhood, and some of you have probably heard that term as well. But in Republican motherhood, again, in conceptualizing women's role, uh, in the early Republic era, and I'm talking about the American Republic, not the Texas Republic, there was this sense that women would stay home and they would raise the, the, the generations of citizens who would make American democracy work. And of course, there was more emphasis on the boys rather than the girls because the boys would be possibly voting. But uh, this gave women some leverage. If they were Republican mothers, then they could argue for certain educational advantages because, after all, they were charged with bringing up these children to guide the new republic. So some of that enters in as well. Now, I'm talking about all this ideology and all these images, and you'll notice that it's rather a rarefied atmosphere, and I'm sure you all are familiar with Sojourner Truth, who said, ain't I a woman? That man over there says that women are supposed to be helped into carriages. <laughs> well, ain't I a woman? And I've gone out and I've worked hard in the fields. And, and so there was this disconnect, this disconnect for many frontier women and certainly for many minority women between all of these images and the realities. And to use just one more example, a, an antebellum southern example, uh, I remember reading a man writing one time about visiting this plantation and dinner that evening was very elegant. The plantation mistress sat at the table with her hair up and, and in a very nice gown, and she presided over the table. And the next morning, this man decided to go out for a walk, and he came across the woman, and she was head down in a pickle barrel. I mean, she was with a couple of the slaves from the plantation, and they were working out out in back, and so she had her, her hair in disarray, and she was, was working with the two slaves to deal with something there with the pickle barrel. And he said, I didn't want to embarrass her, so I just passed on by without acknowledging her. <laughs> And I, I don't know about that, but anyway, it, 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 again, it shows the ways in which the ideology ruled as opposed to the realities. So we have all of these images, and, and you'll notice, I mean, the, on the left hand is a standard domestic scene, and on the right hand is a very famous illustration, Madonna of the Prairie, uh, the, the idea the, of the, the young and virginal woman who's, actually, this is very interesting because uh, the wagon was considered home. I mean, that was the woman's domain. So she's actually sitting at least in her temporary home there, uh, the, the domestic aspect of it. Uh, we have to remember, too, when we think about women in relation to all of this, the Seneca Falls Convention did not occur until 1848. So we're talking about shortly after the end of the Republic. Uh, so the, the first women's rights, National Women's Rights Con uh, Convention for, for suffrage. 
Also, there's this idea of women and manifest destiny. And again, we have the personification, this time of manifest destiny and the Western spirit. John Gast's Westward Ho on the left is a very famous painting that you've probably seen uh, used in a number of ways. But um, this idea that, that helped, certainly helped fuel a lot of what happened in Texas, that Americans were by nature, by birthright, by God-given decree, uh, sent forth to populate the land. It was one of the uh, very powerful myths that Jim was talking about. Uh, you'll also notice that this book on the, the right, True Women and Westward Expansion. This is a very good book. I reviewed it last year uh, for uh, a quarterly. At the same time, uh, there's not a lot here to show that women were very political. Uh, there's little evidence that they were thinking politically. So women in general, whether they were Western women or they were women who were perhaps already already here before the coming of the revolution, um, or Western women who were here before the coming of the revolution, will talk about what was more on their minds. Um, so I, I don't mean to disparage this book because I found it very interesting, but at the same time, you, to be politically um, attuned to the extent that we normally think when we talk about manifest destiny, um, I haven't found much evidence of that among most women. We have Stephen F. Austin's cousin, Mary Austin Holly, and I know many of you are familiar with her work. She encouraged women to come to Texas where women could be free spirits and have a capacity for greatness, which is a nice little quote. Um, the frontiers offered great opportunity for men, less so for women, and I don't say that to be negative, it was just the realities. Uh, it was more difficult for women because women were representative of the cultures left behind to a larger extent in many cases. And I often think I've, I've done quite a bit of general Western history, and I remember in particular, there's a, a woman who wrote about her experiences in Deadwood, South Dakota. Her father was the first judge to go to Deadwood, and it was still a very wild and woolly town. They, uh, they lived right, right pressed up next to a house of prostitution, even though he was the federal judge, and Esteline Bennett was her name. And she wrote about the tremendous freedoms of the frontier for children but she said, my mother never got used to it. And she said she, she had always envisioned that piling into a carriage with her children and driving down a, 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 a path with the trees over it. I mean, she had all of these old Virginia images. And Esteline quoted, I don't know where this is from. I should look it up. But she said, she never loved you as I have loved you, young, young land. So the idea that for women coming into frontier Texas or frontier anywhere, there is more of an adaptation to be made. And interestingly enough, Elliot West's work shows that the children on the frontiers, the girls as well as the boys, were more likely to live out this kind of quote. I just want to go through living conditions, and none of them will be any surprise to you as people who are involved with Texas history. We have a fair amount of isolation. We have lots of uncertainties throughout this period, the shakiness of the Texas Republic, not knowing. I mean, when, when the, we all know this, but we have to be reminded, I think, the revolution, who's going to win? How's it going to turn out? Uh, they lived with so much uncertainty from day to day. Uh, the, the daily demands uh, uh, of work, um, the, the frequent absence of husbands. Some of you, I'm sure, have read Mary Crownover Rab's charming, charming account of uh, her early settlement with her husband. <coughs> 
on Rab's Prairie and in various other places. They moved around quite a bit. And uh, it, it's very poignant to me that, that she would uh, put out corn in the cabin for the pigs to come in and eat the corn so that they would be company for her and the children. And that she would keep her spinning wheel spinning through the night because she could hear the, the Indians moving around outside and she was left alone so much. Another role that that women played and that was acknowledged was that, as I mentioned, of deputy husband. And with the men gone so much, the women relatively stable and the men gone so much, certainly, um, you know, we, we've even seen that into the fairly modern day in the sense that sometimes when a legislator dies, his wife is is recommended to take his place. I mean, I, at least I've seen that in, in my lifetime, but we have uh, women filling the role in, uh, of, of family head in the man's absence. Um, and an unending round of chores, but I don't wait to make too much of it. it I tend to romanticize. My daughter says, Mom, you wouldn't have lasted a week back then. <laughs> But I tend to romanticize, as, as Jim mentioned, I wrote a book about spinning and weaving in Texas, and I just lo love the idea of spinning and, and weaving, and then you think about living in these little cramped cabins and having very weak candlelight to, to do all of this by, and, and I know I, I had a student who told me there was a, a story in her family about her great-grandmother. This was not in Texas, this was up on the northern plains, but when she was able to get rid of her loom, having her husband and her son uh, drag it out and throw it into the nearest ditch because she was so happy to be through with that aspect. But there is a certain romance to the productivity, I think, that, that women uh, uh, evidenced in this era. Even though much woman's work, of course, as the, the example on the right, is very ephemeral and uh, very difficult uh, to, to uh, appreciate, I think, over the long term. When we talk about women's experiences and the conflicts, we've got both their voices and we've got the voiceless. I was so fortunate when I was looking for a dissertation topic that I found Mary Mavericks and Sam Mavericks' diaries and letters in the Barker Texas History Center or the Center for American History at UT. And, and I told somebody this last night, but uh, I still get a thrill telling it, so I'm going to tell it again. I had. I had been working a lot with women on the frontier, but uh, this was back in the early 80s, and there were some good materials out, but uh, there would be accounts that women had written for their children many years later. Maybe they had traveled the Overland Trail, but they just didn't happen to mention they'd had a baby on the Overland Trail. I mean, I was looking for some nitty-gritty stuff here. So uh, I, I went to the diaries, and I asked to, I, I, I picked up Mary Maverick's diary and opened it to 1846. And Sam Maverick was in Austin at the legislature, and Mary was in San Antonio. And this is what I opened it to. No husband and rumors of Indians in Austin. My God, how many times in this miserable existence have I waited for him to come home? And I just said, yes, this is it. This is what I want. And so I was very, very fortunate to work with her diary. Three pages of that diary were torn out. I don't know by whom, but the stuff that was left was pretty good. So I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I remain eternally curious about that. We all know, of course, with the voiceless, that so much of women's history is obscured or lost. And there have been some very interesting ways in which people have sought to get at it now. Homestead's Ungovernable, which looks at families on the Texas frontier and uses a variety of sources. But uh, so many times, we have very little to go on. OK, so we look at the revolution itself. And the first question is, were women active participants? Which actually goes back to uh, what's called in women's history compensatory history. Let's go find some women who fought. <laughs> and that often doesn't work out very well. So uh, we have to usually recast the question. Uh, because active participants, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about political leaders or soldiers. And I'm 
I know there were some camp followers. I understand, I believe, from, from Jim's presentation at TSHA that there were actually a few women with the Mexican Army who were captured during the Battle of San Jacinto. Is that correct? They were at Morgan's Plantation. At Morgan's Plantation, okay. And one was killed, right? That there was, was a different woman. Okay. And we have, like, the Civil War, we have certain women who were spies or who were um, who, who dressed as men and, and were soldiers. I, I'm not really aware, and perhaps some of you all are, but women who participated this overtly, I am not aware. And it would be out of character, given all the messages that women received about what being a woman was. And I'm going to back up here one more time, too, and say when I teach women's history, I like to, to point out that women had three reactions to the roles that were presented for women. The first was to say, oh, yes, that's what a woman should be. And when I was working with Mary Maverick, who did come to Texas in 1838, her husband came in 1835 and then left, but, I mean, after the, after, uh, well, he, he left right after the, the Independence Convention, but that's another story. First, uh, Mary Maverick, she was always very conscious that she needed to be to fit that mold as much as possible. And in reading her diaries and her letters, she comes across as a very, very small, um, shy person, which she wasn't. I was very surprised when I saw a plaster cast of her hand that a Maverick descendant had. It was such a large hand. Uh, and, and the story is that Sam Maverick met her when he was on horseback, and she was on horseback, and he fell in love, and then they got down, and she was taller than he was, but it was too late. Uh, but, <laughs> but she, you know, she presents herself in such insignificant ways, and, and she does seem to want to try to be that kind of woman, to the point of saying, oh, why do my slaves not love me? Well, lady, <laughs> I mean, why should they love you? <laughs> They're slaves. But uh, just, she was someone who did inculcate within herself that ideology of true womanhood. And the second way is the people who say, yes, that's how women should be, but they go their own little merry way. So they may say, oh, yes, yes, women are supposed to, uh, to um, be pious and pure and submissive, but they're really not, but they just, they just live with a disconnect. And then the third way are the women who say, no, that's not me, and I'm not going to pretend that's me. And maybe they even are politicized then as well. And this is a story, and I need to move on, but I've just got to tell you this story, and it's not even from Texas, but there was a woman named Melinda Jenkins who went in the, uh, the Yukon Gold Rush. She joined her husband, and so she, she made the long, long trip up to the Yukon, and, um, and she was coming in on the lighter, on the, the little boat that takes you between the, the ship and the shore, uh, in Dawson, and her husband ran down to the dock because he heard the ship had come in, and he saw her on the lighter, and he said, this is in 1898, he said, what are you doing in pants? She was wearing slacks, and she yelled back, I come the whole way in pants, and he yelled back, well, you could have put on a dress to land in, and she yelled, shut up. I have to talk about Emily West just a little bit, right? Uh, Jim Crisp and, and uh, uh, Jeff Dunn and Jim Lutzwater have done such wonderful work in regard to this. This is her passport, and also at TSHA, they shared his, her one-year employment contract with, with James Morgan. Uh, I see this as women in the path of war. We, we will never know, I think they said at that session on the Yellow Rose of Texas, we will never know all the all the uh, circumstances that led her to be there at San Jacinto and apparently in Santa Ana's tent, at least according to some of the circumstantial evidence. But uh, uh, there are just so many questions here. But indeed she was and probably, I would say, as a captive. And so uh, uh, there are so many legends that surround her. I love what Jim said about Myth is what you're doing when you think have all, you have all the answers already, but clearly she was a woman in the path of war, whether she meant to be or not. 
uh, we're also all familiar with Susanna Dickinson or, or Dickerson and Madame Candelaria, who unfortunately just kept telling all these different stories, both of them, but uh, certainly were because they were at the Alamo, they were um, in, involved whether they wished to be or not. Actually, I prefer this account. I just think this is, is so moving. This is um, Enrique Esparza uh, telling later on about his experiences as a child in the Alamo. And many of you are familiar with Gregorio Esparza's story. He, he did fight for the Texians. Uh, he was the only Alamo defender, I believe, who was actually buried because his brother was uh, fighting with Santa Ana. And the brother went to Santa Ana and asked if he could have the body released for burial. And there was a third brother, I think, who went with him to bury the body. But this is Gregorio Esparza's wife. Um, so they're all marched off, basically under house arrest. Here all of the women were again placed under guard. My mother, being familiar with the premises, began to look about for food for herself and children, as well as her other comrades. And then, so when she's told she needs to go back with the other prisoners, the other people under guard, she told him she did not care if she was under guard or not. She was going to have something to eat for herself, her children, and her companions, whom she intended to feed if Santa Anna did not feed his prisoners. Uh, this, to me, is key to understanding women in conflicts. Women were always concerned with seeing to the needs of their families, with provisioning. And I have, I think, immediately following this. Let's see if I do. No, I don't. I'm going to jump ahead here. Yeah. Glenda Riley wrote a book a number of years ago, Women and Indians on the Frontier. And what I retain from that is that in encounters with Native Americans, women's first thoughts were to their provisions. Will they try to take my flour? Will they try to take my sugar? I mean, there were some other aspects there, too. Obviously, there was the threat of, of actual violence. But women tended to focus more on how do I, how do I keep us all going. Uh, another interesting thing about this account, he said when his mother was released and they went back home that she sat and cried for days, which again I think is so very, very poignant, all the stress of having been in the Alamo and all the events following after it. Everyone I'm sure is familiar with the runaway scrape. I love these illustrations from, from this edition of Evolution of a State. But this also points to the ways in which women were affected by the conflicts of the era that they're, and again, it goes to their livelihood. It goes to all the careful provisioning that they have done. And it was interesting last night in the talk at the bank about the claims that people made about what they had, had lost in the runaway scrape. And if you're familiar with the runaway scrape at all, you're familiar with Dilu Rose Harris. And you'll see her on the, the left and her home in Columbus on the right. Her account as a young girl of the runaway scrape gives us a sense of the confusion and the privation and the difficulties that accompanied that. <coughs> Troubles between settlers and Native Americans. Um, I, I, it's really interesting to me, I, I'm going, I have to make this point because it's one of my favorite points, and when Frank and I were working on the museum, I made it regularly too, but Mary Maverick moved to San Antonio in 1838, and her husband was following the Comanches who were raiding into San Antonio and picking up whoever they could find. And Lewis, who is the son off there to the right, Lewis would die shortly after the Civil War. He died as a very young man. Lewis, he was born at the Alamo, in 1840 with, uh, or 1838 perhaps, I can't remember, but he was born at the Alamo with a Mrs. Black attending. But when Lewis grows up, Lewis is chasing the Comanches who are raiding into San Antonio and picking up people. What does that tell us? That tells us that frontiers lasted longer in Texas than in some other areas of the West. I mean, in some areas of the West, you have settlement, you have railroads come in fairly quickly, but Texas remained a set of frontiers for many, many people for a very long time. And as we all know, the, 
the uh, railroads didn't really get started well until the 1870s. I mean, they built that one in the 1850s that ended in the prairie, five miles into the prairie. But uh, I thought this was so interesting, the Council House fight of 1840, when the Comanches come in to, to treat with the authorities, the Anglo authorities, and the Anglo authorities try to take prisoners and say, you have to go back and get all the people that you've picked up. And then a fight ensues. And so Mary is out there on the street, and she sees this Comanche. And she says, oh, please don't shoot him. And actually, the man responds, well, uh, to please you, I won't won't, but it would put him out of his misery. And then she's still wandering around the streets, and this lieutenant says, you better get off the streets, because there's fighting all, all, all through San Antonio. And I love what she said. I was just 22 then and was endowed with a fair share of curiosity. That's what I've already talked about. Um, however, when we talk about feuds, we do have the threat of rea and reality of violence and captivity. And I'm sure everybody in this room can recognize Cynthia Ann Parker on the, on the right-hand side. And then Mrs. Carolyn Harris was taken by the Indians when she came to Texas. And Cynthia Ann Parker, Parker, of course, acculturated because she was taken as a child and adopted into the tribe. Oh, but, I to give you a two-minute warning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matilda Lockhart had her nose burned off. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, to, are familiar with Texas Tears and Texas Sunshine. If you're not, go out and get it. Wonderful first-person accounts of women on, on the on frontiers, including, I believe, Sylvia King, who was a slave on the, on the Texas frontier. I won't go into Rachel Plummer's narrative, but I actually had a pregnant student once who read it and almost fainted in class because it's pretty horrific uh, about her pregnancy and delivering of a child and the, uh, and the Comanches killing the child. We also have feuds, and actually, this, this slide was used last night <laughs> uh, with, with Angelina Everly, and I also got a picture of the wonderful statue in Austin. I just really like this statue uh, in, in Austin. If you haven't had a chance to go down Congress Avenue and look at it, I mean, she is a massive woman who it means business in, in this statue. <laughs> uh, I talked a little bit with Maureen last night about, about this, about Harriet Ames, and I don't really have time to talk with her now, about her now, but uh, that she was very much affected by the feuds because her husband, or he wasn't really her husband, it's a long story, but Robert Potter was killed in a feud during this time period. And then I'm very close to the end. Mexican incursions, I'm also using Mary Maverick because I know her so well, or I think I do. Uh, this was, uh, Sam Maverick was one of the people who was picked up in San Antonio in 1842. And just to give you a sense, she says, I was then only 24 years of age and almost a child in experience, and I had the care of three helpless little children and the birth of a fourth to look forward to in the future. Loneliness, sickness, anxiety, and sorrow, too deep for expression. So what picture are we left with of women in the conflicts of the Revolution and the Republic? While they were not direct participants in the way, terms that we normally think about when we talk about conflicts of the Revolution and Republic, they were, they were affected. I didn't get to talk about Jane Long and her boarding house. Angelina Eberly, of course, had a boarding house, too. Uh, Jane Long's boarding house, not only did she board soldiers, but um, the plans for the Revolution uh, were apparently in, in part laid there. But really, the basic answer to this question is that they, they came and they stayed and they endured. That's really it. I mean, without the women being here as part of settlement, whether we're talking about Tejanas in, in uh, San Antonio or whether we're talking about Anglos or Europeans in, in Fredericksburg, New Braunfels, whatever, uh, the fact that they came, they committed, they stayed, and they sought the best for their families, uh, that all fed into the Texas we know today. Thank you. Check to see if your mic is working. Uh, let me remind you that if you have a question for uh, Paula to bring it up to me, uh, and I will begin. Uh, and also, if you need to take a break, uh, we're we will take a short break, but begin very soon after uh, after 1025, probably uh, no later absolutely than, than 1030 for our, for our, our, our next speaker. <coughs>
pardon me. Let me just begin with a, uh, and ask a, 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 a sort of historian's question of, of Paula, and that is um, when you're looking at sources for women, you mentioned the Mary Maverick diary. Uh, if you'd bring the questions to me, please, uh, rather than to Paula. Uh, oh, he just gave me a note about uh, helping okay. me out with something. Um, when you're look, I know, I know in the diary of Mary Maverick and the diary of Martha Ballard, we have sources that are just extraordinary about women that we might not know too much about mm -hmm. unless we had their diaries. But beyond diaries, mm -hmm. where do you go? Do you go to legal depositions? Uh, do you go to family letters? Where are the best sources for women's history? I haven't gone to legal depositions, but I have seen people do that quite successfully. I, I really like working with the personal uh, materials, and so, uh, yes, the, the collections of letters in particular uh, I, I find very enriching. In fact, um, th this new book that's coming out, it's, uh, it's a collection primarily of letters from Mary Maverick to family members during the Civil War, but also from family members to her. I know when I was on a prize committee for the TSHA, I ended up persuading my colleagues to give the prize for the best article of the year in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly to a graduate student from the University of Texas who had edited and interpreted the love letters uh, of an African-American couple who were going to college in the 1870s and 80s. That it was, was an good. extraordinary, was uh, 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 she showed an extraordinary ability to tease out meaning and significance and events and relationships and social history from just the most intimate family letters. Uh, uh, what, what seemed to be so personal ended up being uh, extraordinarily historical. May I add well. to that too? You mentioned Martha Ballard. If, if, if you are not familiar with this, this is not a Texas book, but A Midwife's Tale, The Diary of Martha Ballard. It's about frontier Maine, and it's a stunning achievement in taking a diary that really doesn't seem to say much and opening a window to the whole period. I, I also have recommended that to Texas audiences, even though it's not a Texas book. One, one final question, I guess, unless we have any from the floor, and that is this question of balance and the generational issue that you raised. Um, by balance, I mean this. Uh, women are given new burdens and new responsibilities on the frontier. And you've suggested that for some of them, the burden of those new responsibilities seems greater than the liberation that those new responsibilities may bring. Is it only in the second generation or the third generation, someone like Sandra Day O'Connor, where is this feeling of liberation, you know, I can do anything, that she takes all the way to the Supreme Court? Uh, or, or, or do you find, even in first generation frontier women, those who bear the brunt of it, that some of them feel more liberated than they do burdened by the life on the frontier? Yes, that's a good point, and I would agree that some do feel more liberated. Um, if anyone has read the memoirs of Ella Elgar Bird Dumont, who, who lived up in the Panhandle, yeah. she certainly ha felt a certain freedom. So, um, so yes, I mean, it's, it's sometimes a mix for these women. Thank you. It's not as if they are all just totally overburdened. I mean, they, they chose to be here. They, uh, they see the economic op opportunity for their family along with their husbands. Uh, so, it, yes, you're right. It's uh, a little bit of both. I can't read your hand right. I'm sorry. Uh, very quickly, do Maybe you know what do you know about Pamela Mann's role in the uh, events leading up to San Jacinto? I don't know anything, and I have some gaps in my knowledge, so I'm more than happy I think, to. I, think, I mean, I, I I've heard the name, but right. I think that, that this has uh, uh, mm -hmm. has to do with the, uh, if I remember correctly, the oxen. Uh, oh, and, that's right. And whether the oxen, Sam Houston, that's a good example. And whether yes. Sam Houston yes, was yes, going yes. to Nacogdoches or some right. other place. Right. And yes. by golly, uh -huh. I think it was Conrad Rohrer, was that's it not, right. who felt the, the wrath of Pamela Mann right. when he tried to yeah. go and get those oxen back for Sam Houston. Right. And again. And he came back bloodied uh, <laughs> from his... Uh, from his encounter with Pamela Mann. Thank and I you. think that does demonstrate the, the main point very well, too, about the women holding on to what they need, what they know they need and their families need. Um, this is a, a, a note that says, love is a wild assault. That sounds like mm -hmm. a movie I saw late one night, but 
Um, uh, uh, it's a novel memoir. Uh, is this a good historical source? Do you know that source, Love? Is I a used, wild you'll assault. notice I used the cover there, yes. Uh, well, it, I it, couldn't see it from my angle, okay, I'm sorry, I couldn't okay, read the cover. Yeah. Uh, it, it, at least it's an imaginative recreation of the experiences that Harriet Ames went through. Uh, I enjoyed it, I wouldn't treat it as an historical source necessarily, but sometimes we, we like entering vicariously in in ways that we cannot do necessarily through the historical record. Thank you, Paula, and uh, we will enjoy having you for the rest of the morning, and we're sorry we're going to lose you for the afternoon, but thanks for taking a few of these questions. Um, I'm going to ask uh, that, we, that we break for only five minutes or less uh, and give David Pomeroy and Fred McGee a chance to get up onto the uh, stage, and then we will begin sharply uh, at 10.30. <laughs>